So it is great. Let's start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather around your word tonight. We ask that you be with us. Send your Holy Spirit that uh, um, he may bless our study of your word and we may understand uh, just how good you are to us. As we consider tonight's faith, um, fill us with gratitude that, that you have changed our hearts, that you have made us your own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so anyone have any questions from last time? Last time we, uh, we had some good questions, so we much done in the book, but that's okay. I like those weeks. Um, it, it means some good questions were asked. Um, any carryover, any follow-up thoughts or, or uh, anything to talk about on that? We, we looked at, at Jesus, right? We looked at uh, true God, true man. His humiliation, his exaltation, um, and then the really the gift of salvation that he gives. Uh, okay, then let's roll into chapter four. Chapter four, we talk about the Holy Spirit. So in uh, lesson one, we looked at God, looked at a whole bunch of attributes of God. Lesson three, we looked at Jesus, you know, the Christ, the Messiah, the uh, Emmanuel, all those names for him. Uh, and now today, uh, we're going to look at, first of all, just who is the Holy Spirit? So one of the three in one, one of the three persons uh, in the Godhead, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, the second Corinthians passage you've seen before, uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then, so he, he's, he's one of the three persons of the Trinity. Um, and the next passage I have in there just... I think that there are a lot of people who kind of have this feeling that the spirit is like a, a secondary part of the Trinity, you know, like less important. Um, but he is true God, uh, totally equal with father and son as far as being God. Um, and the passage there, Acts 5, uh, will do the, the player pass. Uh, Marion, you want to play or pass? You'll play. All right, Acts 5. Uh, the second passage there. Yeah. Then Peter said, <clears throat> Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money received for the land? Did it belong to you before it sold? And after it sold, was the money for its total? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so this is uh, Acts 5, the early Christian church. Um, the, the Bible talks about how they were so helpful and, and, and showing love to one another and, and the poor. Uh, they wanted to take care of the poor. And we hear about a guy named Joseph who uh, sold the piece of property and, and brought in all the money he got from the sale of the property, gave it to the apostles and said, I want you to use this to help the poor. And it must have been that everybody said, oh, wow, that's so great, Joseph. Because uh, then Ananias and Sapphira, this, this couple, uh, they said, hey, um, let's do that. And, and so they went and sold the piece of property that they had. And they, it was theirs. They could do whatever they wanted with the money. But they kept some of it and then brought some of it to the apostles and said, this is everything we got for selling the property. Uh, we want you to give it to the poor. Um, now, they didn't have to give any of it, but the problem is they lied, right? And so notice in that passage, when uh, Peter is talking to Ananias, he said, okay, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And then look at what he says a couple lines later. You didn't lie to men, but to God. The Holy Spirit is God. That, that's the point of the, this first part. Holy Spirit, true God. Any questions or comments on that? That's, that's the easy part. The rest of the study then is going to look at what the Holy Spirit does. You know, when you think about the, the Trinity, for us, you know, it's mind-blowing to, to think about one, 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 one. One plus one plus one equals one. Um, we, we don't fully understand how, it, how they all interact and, and all of that because it's God. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. But normally, when the Bible talks about the Father or the work of the Father, it talks about creation, right? So we talk about, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, right? The creator. Um, normally, 
when the Bible talks about the work of the sun. Now, yes, he was involved in creation. He was there. It uh, does a lot of things. But normally, the Bible talks about the sun as the redeemer, right? He's the one who died to pay for my sins. And that's kind of the focus of his work. Uh, and then the, the Holy Spirit usually gets the title sanctifier. So to, to sanctify is to make holy. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes us holy. And we're going to talk about what exactly that means as, as we go into the lesson. But, but to start, I want us to think about what we were before the Holy Spirit did that work. Before the Holy Spirit gave us faith, before he, he uh, made us a child of God, before he uh, uh, influenced us to, to live more God-pleasing lives, what were we? The Bible is really clear. It says it many, many times, over and over and over. Uh, and, and in fact, uses some pretty powerful pictures to describe what we were by nature. So this is apart from God's work on us, this is what we would be without him. Uh, and, and the first picture we're going to talk about is that picture of death. Uh, by nature, I'm dead in sin. Judy, do you want to play or pass on Ephesians 2, 1? Okay, so you think about a, a dead body. Um, what can a corpse do? Not a whole lot, right? Rot. Rot, yeah. And in fact, that's not even the corpse doing it. That's the, the bacteria working on the corpse from outside, right? So it, it can't even rot. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it, uh, it feeds some, some worms, right? But uh, uh, completely passively, right? There, there's nothing it can do. If, um, my wife, when, when uh, we got married, my wife was a nurse. After we had our first kid, she decided she didn't want to do that anymore. So, um, but we always, when we were dating and whatever, we always had uh, one of those medical shows that we watched. When we first started, it was ER, and then, then Grey's Anatomy came along. And, and uh, um, so that was you know, our thing for a while. Uh, if you're watching one of those shows, and they've got the, the guy on the gurney, and then it goes flatline, right? You know what that means? The, the, the no pulse, he's dead. If you're watching the show, and suddenly the guy uh, uh, sits up, grabs a couple of paddles, and yells, you know, charge it to 200, clear, and, and then he uh, shocks himself back to life, I, I'm, I'm guessing you probably wouldn't watch that show much longer. That's just that's not believable, right? That cannot happen. We understand when someone is dead, they're dead. They can't do anything. And so now think about what that means, that God says that by nature, we were dead. When it comes to our relationship with him, we were dead. We had no power to, to do anything. And not only that, but the Bible says that by nature, we are hostile to God. Bill, you want the uh, Romans 8 passage? Okay. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Okay. So not only were we not able to do anything, by nature, if we could have done anything, it would not have been to come to God. It would have been to fight against God. Um, so hostile to God. By nature, the Bible says we think his word is foolish. Um, <clears throat> Vicar, you want 1 Corinthians 2? <clears throat> the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Okay. Um, you know, if my kids, you know, they're, they're kind of out of out of the, the Teletubbies now, but, but a few years ago, if my kids would have come to me and said, uh, hey, Dad, uh, you got to take all your money and, and, and send it to this, this website. You know, the Teletubbies are going to take over the world, and whoever sends them all their money, uh, they get to be on their side, and, and then they'll have, you know, it'll be a great thing. Uh, so just let's get in the Teletubby army, and we will be great. Just send all your money in there. Um, what do you think the chances of me sending any money to the Teletubbies to join the Teletubby army to take over the world would be? Um, not good. I I'll tell you, I'm not sending any money there. Why? Because that's foolish. There's no way that that, uh, that, that makes any sense. And, uh, you know, that, that's what God says by nature. That's what we think about his message. A message that God, the one in control, that we wronged would sacrifice instead of demanding something from us. Um, that doesn't make any sense. And by nature, I'm inclined toward evil 
Uh, Angie or Karen, you want uh, you want Genesis six five? Uh, you're on mute. You want you want to pass? All right, Kat. That was Genesis six five, right? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were was only evil all the time. Okay. By nature, evil. Um, you know, we can, w without God, we can choose between what kind of sin, uh, either sin that's completely selfish and harmful to others or, or sin that makes me feel good about myself because, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing something uh, so that I look good. Um, but it's sin, it's, it's evil. So we have all these on here, and there are many, many more to drive home a point, right? By nature, dead, hostile. There's, there's no way we're, we're going to be convinced because we think it's foolish, and, and we are sinful. That's what we are by nature. The Holy Spirit changes that. Uh, you know, as we talk about the sanctifier, uh, the Bible talks about how God changes us from dead to alive. Um, he, he calls me to faith through the word. In, uh, on the top of page 22 there, you've got the uh, example of Saul slash Paul. So if you remember Paul, the great uh, New Testament missionary going all over, spreading the good news, uh, built all these, or established all these churches. Uh, this is him telling the story of his younger days uh, when he was on trial speaking to, to King Agrippa and uh, the Jews had arrested him saying, hey, he's preaching something that's contrary to our religion because he was preaching Jesus, right? The fulfillment of all the promises of their religion. Um, and, and so this, this is his defense. So I'll read this one because I want to break it up a little bit. He says, I too was convinced that I have to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So these guys are saying, hey, this guy's got to stop preaching Jesus. And Paul says, oh, yeah, I agreed with you at one time. I was totally on your side. He said, that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. The blaspheme is basically to, to, to deny God. So to say that Jesus isn't God would be blaspheming. So he wanted them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So if anyone was opposed to Jesus, it was Paul, he used to go by Saul. Um, he hated the idea of Christianity, right? On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads were the, the sharp things that made an animal go in a certain direction, you know, around the, around the wheel. And if he tried going the other way, the, the goads would get him. And, and, you know, this voice is telling Paul, hey, you're going the wrong way, right? Then I asked, who are you, Lord? So he uses that word saying, I know you're more powerful than me because you just, you know, the bright light, you just knocked me down. You're, you're something divine. Uh, and and uh, he says, who are you? The answer? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Think about that. Paul had been thinking he was doing the right thing, that he was fighting for God. He was getting rid of this name of Jesus. And now he, he meets something divine. And, and, and he's told, it's me. It's the one you're saying is, is nonsense. Um, then Jesus said, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Um, so you, you think about Paul's attitude prior to conversion. Um, 
his attitude toward Christianity, you, you couldn't get much more hostile, right? So he hated it. God appears in a bright light. God renders him powerless. And then you have the one of the easiest questions in the book. Which statement is more accurate? A, Paul willingly chose to become a Christian, or B, although Paul was unwilling, God brought him to faith. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? B, B right? I mean, there, there's no way to, uh, to take that any other way. Uh, of course, Paul said, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. Jesus says, you're going to be a Christian. In fact, I'm going to send you out to make other people Christians too. Um, he changed Paul's heart. And I put this in here because normally when there's a conversion, when someone goes from unbelief to faith, we don't see it, right? Because it goes on in the heart. And maybe it's real gradual. Maybe it's it's instantaneous. It's different for everybody. Um, but we don't see it. Here, we get to see it, as Paul tells the story of what God was doing with him. Um, and, and that's how God works. You know, he takes us from unbelief to faith, and it's always his working, right? Um, and, and that's what the Bible says. Through faith, God takes us from death to life. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. So this is a couple verses after that one that Judy read, that we were dead. Uh, now let's read Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. Mary Beth, you want that one? Sure. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in, trans in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Okay. We were dead. He made us alive. Why? Because he loved us. Faith is a gift of God and, and not my works. Uh, looks like, I think we're, Ruth, do you want to read any? I don't know if you can hear me. Otherwise, we'll go back into the room. Mary, and you want to take uh, Ephesians 2 8? Yeah. <clears throat> For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Yeah, the gift of God. It's not from yourselves. You know, it says it's not by works so no one can boast. It's God's gift, this gift of faith. And God uses the word. Faith comes from hearing the powerful word. Romans 10, 17. Judy, you want that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. He uses the word. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. So the Holy Spirit uses the word to give us that gift of faith, to, to bring faith where there was unbelief, to make a, a heart of stone in, into a, a heart of flesh, uh, you know, a beating heart of, of faith. Uh, it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Dale, you want to read 1 Corinthians 12, 3? Okay. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is the Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, you know, if someone is, is cursing Jesus, he says, well, that means you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have faith, right? But if you're saying Jesus is Lord, he said there's only one way that that happens. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, it's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Any questions on that? We were hostile to God. God changed our hearts. Does that make sense? When, when you look at scripture, that's how it describes it. I know different people talk about it in different ways. Um, you know, they talk about, well, uh, when I invited Jesus into my heart, um, well, how would it be possible for anyone to invite Jesus into their heart? Why would they want to? Well, by nature, they wouldn't, but only if God had worked faith in their heart. Uh, so sometimes that can be a, a confusing type of statement because it almost sounds like I'm the one doing it, right? I'm changing my heart. I'm changing my mind. Whereas God says, by nature, we think it's foolish. We're not going to change our mind, but he changes our hearts and minds. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? That's a place where a lot of times some questions come up. I've got a couple at the end of the lesson that, that we can we can talk about, but let's let's get this next part in there then. Uh, so the Holy Spirit brings me to faith, so makes me holy in that sense, right? Because by faith uh, we we receive that gift of justification, the uh, uh, the forgiveness of sins that Jesus won for all people is given to me through faith. That's the the arm that receives it, and so the Holy Spirit gives me faith, so He makes me holy in that way. But then he also 
sanctifies me or makes me holy in strengthening me to live more and more like I am a child of God. Um, you know, once I become a believer, does that mean I become perfect? No, I've still got the sinful nature in me. So this, this life of sanctification is one of constantly battling the sinful nature and seeking to be better and better, more of a, a godly person. So we look at some passages there about how the Holy Spirit does that. So the Holy Spirit sanctifies me or sets me apart for a life of godly living through the gospel. So just like he uses the word to bring us to faith, he uses the word to strengthen our faith and help us live our faith. Uh, John 17, 17. Um, Dale, is that your turn? Or did you just read? I just read it. I don't read it. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Okay. Um, you know, make them holy by the truth. That, that's your word. Uh, John 15, 5. Vicar, I'll let you read that one. That's kind of a, a theme passage at uh, Abiding Grace. Um, go ahead. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah, powerful picture Jesus uses, right? Without a connection to him, we can't do anything. Uh, but as we are connected to him, uh, we can do amazing things as he strengthens us to do them. So he uses the word, uh, that connection with Jesus to, to sanctify us. He sanctifies us for a life of producing good works done in faith. Hebrews 11 talks about how without faith, it is impossible to please God. Um, if I'm not doing it out of faith in God, I'm, I'm sinning because it's a selfish thing. Um, he sets me apart for a life of producing good works done according to God's will. Um, Karen or Angie, you want you want that one? Matthew 15, 9. Um, they will worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Yeah, this is Jesus talking about the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were were the church people of Jesus' day. They were the ones that were there all the time, that they said all the right prayers and they wore the right clothes and they did the right things and they gave the right offerings and, and all of that. Uh, and, and they in fact made more rules than God had. They stacked them up just to make sure that they, that they uh, you know, were as perfect as they could be. And as Jesus is talking about all these extra rules they've made, uh, you know, you gotta fast twice a week, you gotta do this, that, and the other thing. Jesus says, those are just rules taught by men. That, that's not worship of God. Um, he wants us to do uh, good works done according to his will, what he asks us to do, what he prepares for us. Kat, you want Ephesians 2.10? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, this is right after that passage about by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And then he says, for we are God's work. And he says, it's not our works that save us, but God has made us. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So he made us when he did through Jesus. Why? So that we can do the good works that he's prepared for us. You know, even us doing good works. Well, he gave us the opportunity to do that. Um, so he strengthens us for that. And all the good works that we do are designed to be done to God's glory, not mine. Uh, Mary Beth, do you want uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Sure. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it, do it all for the glory of God. Okay. All for the glory of God, uh, whatever we do. Um, so that's whether it's uh, preaching a sermon or, or cleaning the toilets, whether it's uh, you know, changing a baby's diaper or, or building a children's hospital, uh, whatever we do for is to be done to God's glory. And it can be because all of those things are things that, that God has given us to do, that he's given us the ability to do, the health to do, the, the know-how and, and all of that. Any questions on that and the good works to God's glory? In, in Matthew 25, when Jesus is talking about the last day, he said, you know, there are going to be those on the right, those going to heaven, and he'll say, you did all these things for me. And they'll say, when did, you do, when did we do those things? You know, when did we see you hungry and feed you? And Jesus says, well, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. All of our works are, are a thanks to God. Um, 
so he sanctifies me for life to do some good works unto God's glory. And he sanctifies me for a life of fighting our sinful flesh. Now we talk about when, when we come to faith, that doesn't make us perfect. It makes us forgiven. And so we're perfect in God's eyes, but it, it, we, we still have the battle going on. And so God says we need his strength to fight that battle. Uh, let's read Hebrews 3. Uh, Marion, we're back in the room. You want that one? <clears throat> yes. Say to your brothers that none of you has a perfect, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Okay. Um, you know, don't. So he's talking to brothers, so fellow believers. He says, don't let your heart become unbelieving and turn away from God. How about Hebrews 10 26? Judy, you want that one? That's kind of a scary one, isn't it? Um, if we deliberately keep on sinning, uh, there's no sacrifice for sins of us. Now, now notice, he doesn't say if we sin after we come to a knowledge of the truth. So, you know, we find out about Jesus, we're a believer, and then we sin, we lose it. Nope, he doesn't say that. Uh, he doesn't He doesn't even just say if we deliberately sin. You know, if, if I know something's wrong and I say, oh, I know that's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, that would be a deliberate sin. Um, and that's bad, right? We don't want to do that. God God says we should live for him, and anytime we choose not to, we're we're sinning, we're rebelling against God. But when that happens... What do we do as believers? We, we say, Lord, forgive me. Now, I, I can't believe I did that, or I can believe I did that because I'm a sinner, but, but Lord, forgive me. And, and what does God do? He forgives me. But he says, if we deliberately keep on sinning. So in other words, if I know it's wrong and I say, well, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway. And, and then I do it. And then I say, oh, sorry, God, um, help me not do that again. And then the next day I know it's wrong, but I eventually say, oh, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and then when it dawns on me, uh, what did I do? Lord, forgive me. And God forgives me. And every time I am repentant of that sin, he forgives me. But the more I say, I don't care what God says, the less I'm going to care what God says, right? The more I continue in that sin, I'm making choices that make it harder not to sin. And, and the more I'm going to harden myself and not care what God says. And if I don't care what God says, then I'm not going to be repentant. I'm not going to uh, ask for his forgiveness and his strength to fight against it. Um, so he's warning about that repetitive continuing to live in a sinful situation and in sinful activity. Any questions there? Okay. And I've got some questions for you. First one, can faith be lost? Okay. Yep. Yep. I heard a yes. Everybody agree with the yes? Okay. Got a couple of yeses. I mean, I, th I think you look at you look at those two passages we just read, right? He said, "Brothers, uh, don't let your heart turn sinful and unbelieving." Um, and he says, "If we deliberately keep on sinning, no sacrifice for sins is left." You might think of Judas, one of the disciples, um, got overwhelmed by the love of money, or Saul, who was a, a good king, blessed by God, and then then he got selfish and, and self-centered and, and forgot about God. Um, and neither of them ended up well, according to the scripture. Uh, so can faith be lost? Yes. Does that mean, you know, there are, anyone ever hear the saying, once saved, always saved? That, that's kind of a, a popular teaching, especially, especially around this area uh, in the South. Um, but it ignores these passages. It, it focuses on the passages where God makes promises. Does God make promises? He says, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. He says, no one can pluck you out of my hand, right? So God makes promises to a believer that we can have confidence that, that we will always be his. But he also gives warnings. He, he says, no one can pluck you out of my hand, but he doesn't force us to stay in it. We can choose to jump out of that hand. Satan's not more powerful than Jesus, but if we say, you know what, Jesus, I don't need you. I'm going to handle this myself. That's when we get into trouble. Um, but with Jesus, nothing can defeat us. Nothing can separate us from him. Miriam. Uh, just say something. Just make something All right. Is God more powerful than Satan? Yes. Okay. Um, 
feel like there's something behind that question, though. Yeah. <laughs> One of my fellow students, I conversed with on that at length. Uh, we talked about health situations. <laughs> okay. And uh, he says, I decided that most of that can be related to something called demonic repression. So he told me that he, that he gives out pills, he gives out drugs. He said, God, if you will take me home, if God take me home, I might do this thing. Now. So <coughs> then another student responded on the thread that you said that to. He said, uh, Well, things wouldn't happen to don't happen to people unless the uh, devil spoke to God and asked. And that really put me back. So yeah, so you've got uh it isn't excuse me, it isn't oh. Joe. This is yep. Exactly. yep. All will help him Joe. Yeah, I, I was just gonna bring that up. That's probably where he well, was coming yeah. from. Yeah, where where he he was coming from uh um when now Job was a believer and God blessed him in a lot of ways. And uh, it, it, you know, God said, look, here's a wonderful believer, uh, faithful in all he does. And Satan says, oh, he's just, he's just faithful because you give him everything. And, and uh, God says, okay, go ahead, test him. Um, but don't do this. So each time he said, okay, you can do this, but you can't take his life uh, or you can't touch his health. And then after that, Job was still faithful and said, look, well, yeah, that's because he's still got his health. And God said, okay, you can take his health, but don't take his life. So it was all within God's limits. You know, we, in, in Revelation, it talks about, you know, Jesus casting down Satan and, and uh, um, you know, being bound with a, a chain, you know, that Satan is, is restricted in his activity. Now, God does let him roam the earth and tempt us and test us. Uh, but again, that's for our good. Like we talked about with the tree in the Garden of Eden, why did God put that there? So that they had a chance to worship God by loving God, by obeying God. Uh, God lets Satan test us, one, so that he makes us stronger through that as we learn to trust God more. Uh, and, and two, so that we are so that we are turning to God for help, so that our relationship with God is, is growing stronger. Uh, see those victories. But they are real tests, which means we can decide, I'm going to do the wrong thing. And that's going to have negative effects. But yeah, Satan is bound. Um, you know, when, when he rebelled against God, God cast him down and, and said, you, you've got limits on you. And I, in the end, on the last day, he's going to be permanently shut out forever. Um, so it's, uh, is God more powerful than Satan? Absolutely. Uh, does it seem that way? Not always. I mean, sometimes it seems like Satan's, Satan's winning. And, and I think that's really, you know, if you, if you read through Revelation, and again, I'd, I'd encourage you first read the rest of the Bible because Revelation really builds on a lot of the pictures that the rest of the Bible has um, has given. It uh, it assumes a knowledge of what Scripture says, uh, but in Revelation, Jesus gives John. So the Apostle John had been arrested for speaking the truth, uh, had been uh, put on an island in exile basically on, on a prison island, um, separated from the people that he cared about and he wanted to help. And, and Jesus comes to him and says, I'm going to give you a vision. I want you to write it down. I want you to send it to, to those believers and, and so that they can be comforted in their persecution as well. And, and the whole message of Revelation is look at how bad it's getting. Uh, Satan's doing this. Satan's doing that. He's attacking in this way. He's attacking from the secular world. He's attacking even within the church. Uh, and, and it looks like he's going to win but then Jesus is vic victorious. You know, time is. Okay. Which is not true. And then yeah. the son of Pete Thomas said to him, he said, you know, Mr. Williams, <clears throat> each of us every day is surrounded by a host of angels and devils, each vying for our attention. Yeah. Yeah, there's spiritual warfare going on that we don't think about a whole lot, but. I think when we, when we realize, you know, what, whatever your temptation is, you know, you know what I mean like by that, you know, some, some things like, you know, I've, 
I uh, uh, don't have to worry about certain sins because they, they just, they don't even appeal to me. And that, that's just no way would I ever do something like that. That's just foolish, right? You know, why would you get into drugs? That's just, you know, but there are other sins that are really a struggle for me. Whereas someone else who might say, yeah, my struggle is, is this one, uh, but that one's not a problem at all. We all have those, our own temptations and Satan knows what they are and he's attacking. Um, and I, and I for, I'm forgetting where I was going with that, but uh, um, you know, you, you had talked about the, uh, oh, the angels and demons and, and all of that. We understand that battle that goes on between the Holy Spirit and our sinful nature. Uh, I always go back to Romans 7. You know, the, the, the good I want to do, I don't always do, and the evil I don't want to do, I keep on doing, and, and that, that battle that goes on within us. Um, and so, yeah, God, you know, there are those temptations. And if we keep going to them and say, I don't, I don't care what God says, and we're not repentant, eventually we're jumping out of his hand. He says, no one can put you out of my hand, but we can jump. Um, so that, that's a pretty serious warning, right? I've always thought it's an interesting how most congregants um, see the fast book as a, a homosexual book. Hmm. Don't you think? Yeah, the, yeah. I, I don't know why. <laughs> Sinless, you know. Uh, I, I, well, forgiven. Uh, I'll claim that, forgiven. Not sinless, I wish. I, I am working towards that, but uh, it'll, it, it'll be a lifelong, lifelong uh, thing. I mean, that's, uh, and, you know, and that's interesting too. You know, you talk to other pastors and yeah, some of the temptations that affect pastors are totally different than ones, but they're still temptations and they're still, you know, um, so, yep, yeah. So, yeah, so can faith be lost? Yes. How about, how about the next one there? Is church attendance important? Yes and no. Yeah. Okay. We got a yes. We got a yes and no. Anyone online want to weigh into that one? We got some yeses. Yeah, I think Why? it is. Why? Because that's how you learn to educate yourself. Okay. That, that's how I learned. Yeah, I'm going to church. I'm in God's word. I'm here. But, but couldn't, I, couldn't I read the word on my book if I learned that way? Yeah, but then you can interpret your own way. Then I could what? You could interpret it wrong or something. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, uh, if I am by myself, our minds have an amazing ability to find what we want to see. Right? Um, you know, I've heard people use the Bible to defend things that the Bible is just blatantly so clear that it says no that's not okay and they say no but it says this and this and this and just ignore the clear passages about, about something else uh we have a way of, of uh wanting whatever we're reading god's word to show how good we are right because by nature we're proud we're sinful we're we're self-centered uh that's the the sinful nature in each of us um so yeah there's that danger when I don't have others to keep me accountable, uh, it, it, it's dangerous. Uh, that's why I tell you guys, you know, when, when, you're, when we're in class, when you're reading scripture, uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, look at what God says. Dig in, study. And if there's something I'm saying doesn't sound right, talk to me about it. Let's, uh, let's dig into the word and, and find answers there. Um, so, yeah, uh, I could get steered in the wrong direction, you know, um, You've probably heard the example of, uh, you know, you're sitting by a fire and, and there's all the coals in the fire and, and uh, it's, it's blowing and going and it's nice and warm and you take one of the coals out and you put it by itself and, and the fire keeps going and it's glowing and it's nice and warm not too long, though that one coal is cold. You know, we, we need each other. God tells us we need that encouragement uh, of others. Uh, and I'm going to guess I know where you were going with your yes and no, Mary. And you want to explain the, uh, you said you said yes and no when I asked if church attendance was important. Yeah. I was thinking of, I think that there's, um, advantage to being alone sometimes. Okay. And being with the Lord. Yep. And that advantage. Yeah. Um, I guess it's all it is. 
Okay. So so absolutely there there's advantage to I just will say I can be with God on Sunday morning at Lake Park. Okay. Is, is God there? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, but he also promises to be in a special way where people are gathered together <laughs> around to, you know, where two or three are gathered together, my name there, am I with them? Um, and you know, Mary Beth's warning about uh, about getting steered in, in a different direction. Um, and the, the reality of our sinful nature that uh, I could focus on God and grow in his word and read the Bible on Lake Hartwell on a Sunday morning. Am I doing that? Um, you know, we, we need others to hold us accountable. God, God wired that into us. Remember when he created Adam? First thing, you know, first thing that anything was wrong with, he says, well, he's not complete yet because he's alone. Uh, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll say, I don't think church has to be the stone and mortar building either. Okay. And she said, it doesn't have to be just the stone and mortar building either. Um, you know, it's, it's when we are gathered with fellow believers around God's word. Um, you know, we build the stone and mortar building so that we've got a place that, that we can do that. But for the first eight years of abiding grace, it was you know, wherever we were, you know, meeting in people's houses and, and uh, you know, renting a, a school cafeteria and, you know, all of that. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting, like right now, is this church, uh, as you guys are, you guys that are online are, some of you are by yourself, but you're not, you're gathering with us around the word so that we can discuss it and, and look at look at it without our self-centered blinders on, but uh, as, as God's word explains it. Good, good. I mean, so to kind of drill down even more on this, uh, can someone be saved without going to church every week? Absolutely, right? You know, it's not, I went to church this many times, so I earned heaven. Um, but at the same time, God tells us we need that habit and we need that encouragement of others. Um, so it's not by being good enough at my church attendance, I'm, I'm saved, but what happens there? We're hearing God's word, we're being fed his word, we're encouraging others, uh, even without saying anything. You know, the, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. I, I love college football, college basketball, and I've got a couple of teams that I follow. And so when I watch the games and this whole year, the announcers just talking about no fans in the stands, right? And it's a whole different thing. Uh, it's a very different thing watching a game sitting on your couch than being in a, in a stadium with 100,000 people. Um, you do things together that I don't do sitting on my couch. You know, you're shouting and singing school songs and things like that. Um, so, yeah, God's wired us for that connectivity and, and it's a blessing to us. So yeah, church attendance is important. Um, predestination, that's a, a big one there. Um, the, the next question, what is predestination? This is, this is one that there's a lot of misunderstanding around. Some people hear the word predestination and they look at it kind of like um, fatalism, right? God's determined everything that's ever going to happen, so it doesn't really matter what I do because it's all determined already, uh, and, and so why care? That's not what the Bible talks about when it talks about predestination. Yes, God knows everything that's happening and that's going to happen, but he gives us free will to make choices that will affect what happens next for us, even though he knows what choices we're going to make and all of that. Um, but so it's not as if it doesn't matter what I do, right? We heard Paul's war we heard those warnings from from Hebrews, right? Uh, to be careful what we do, uh, because it does matter. Um, so it's not predestination is not fatalism. Uh, there are others that talk about predestination and and look at it, um, what I call double predestination, where they say God determined before time, before uh, we were even here, He determined which ones would be in heaven and He determined which ones would be in hell. He said, I want you. And he says, I don't want you. That's double predestination. That's not what the Bible says either. Uh, right? You know, the Bible says God wants all to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, we'll, we'll get more into that. Let's, 
when, when the Bible talks about predestination, and, and I'll admit, this is one of the teachings of Scripture that I wrestled with most. Uh, I remember in, in uh, uh, college, just really struggling with it, and, and you know, it just doesn't make sense. I don't get it. Uh, and then uh, an RA, uh, I was talking to him about it, and, and he said, John, go back look up every passage you can find that talks about predestination or election that uses either of those words and ask yourself two questions. Who is it talking to? And what's the purpose? And every time you find the same things, it's always in a discussion to believers where God is saying, before you were born, I knew you and I picked you. And it's always there to comfort us. It's not to warn someone or say, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Um, it, it, this is one of those things that's beyond our mind. So let me, let me read that, that passage there from Ephesians 1. <clears throat> so I want to make a few comments as we go. Paul writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual good thing we have, it's from him, right? And he did it in Christ. So, so because of what Jesus did through our relationship with him, he's given us all these spiritual blessings. And now he starts listing some of these spiritual blessings that, that God has been working for us and to us. He says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He knew exactly what we were going to be. He knew our sins. He knew all of that. And he says, I want you. Insert your name there. Uh, I, I want you, before he even created the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. So to make us his holy, perfect children. In love, he predestined us. So pre, beforehand, destined, said where we're going to go. Us to be adopted as his sons. So he predestined us to be a part of his family. Through Jesus Christ. Of course, that only happens because Jesus died to pay for our sins and give us perfection so that we can, so that we can be in his family. So adopted as a son through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. This is what God wanted. To the praise of his glorious grace. We say, yay, God, because of this, right? I mean, that, that's what praise is, right? So we say, wow, God's awesome because he does this for us. His grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So through Jesus, he shows us grace. In him, Jesus, we have redemption. So that's talking about the payment price. Right, So he, he chose us, he predestined us, and now he paid the price for us. Right, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This is all God's grace too, the fact that he paid for our sins. His grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He knew what he was doing. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. So we would not have known this unless he revealed it to us. So, so Paul says he made this known to us uh, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. At the end, we, we get to go to heaven. This is what it all boils down to. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He, he does what he says he's going to do. In order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So whether Jew or Gentile, he used the word to, to bring in those that he uh, was, was bringing in. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So like a, a down payment, uh, the, the, the seal, the proof of what is coming. Um, we have the Holy Spirit marking us so you know and, and how do we know we have the holy spirit well if we can say jesus is lord right so that's proof that all of this is happening for us the holy spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are god's possession to the praise of his glory a lot in there any questions on that passage how, how, how would you describe grace simply I've, I've heard a, a few different ways. Um, you know, some people talk about the use the acronym God's riches at Christ's expense. The, 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 the word grace refers to uh, God's absolutely undeserved, unmerited um, 
love that is not anything to do with us. It's all to do with him. So uh, sometimes people will, will contrast grace and mercy. They're talking about the same thing, right? It's God's love for us. But grace focuses on the aspect that it's a gift. The, the, the word is from the root uh, karen, which is, which is gift. So it's, it's a gift. It's God gives, even though we didn't deserve it, not because we did anything to, to make him want to give it. Uh, he gives because he wants to give because that's who he is. Mercy says God gives or God loves us because we really needed it and there is a lot to be pitied in us. Um, but it's both the same thing. But grace, so when, when he uses that word grace, it's focusing on the gift aspect of it. So God says, you don't deserve it, I'm giving it to you. Uh, I, I talk about God's undeserved promised love as my definition for grace. His undeserved promised love. So he promises he's going to give it to me. I don't deserve it at all. He loves me. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Romans 8, 28, um, or 8, 29 and 30 gives a, a much more concise uh, layout of predestination. Whose turn is it to read? Judy? Okay. Okay, notice that that lockstep progression, right? So those he predestined, he called. So before we were even born, he said, I want you. And then when we were born, sometime during our life, he called us through the gospel, right? Uh, here's his word, the Holy Spirit working on my heart. Those he called, he justified. Remember, that's that courtroom term. The, the gavel comes down and God declares us not guilty. So he called us to faith. He justifies us through faith. And those he justified, he also glorified. God already sees us in heaven because he doesn't have to wait for what happens next. He's already there. Um, so the, the idea with predestination, God is saying to you, I got you. I love you so much. I chose you before you were even born. It's not whether you were good enough or not. I mean, so that, that takes the pressure off of us, right? Question, Mary? Uh, well, so he, he selected you. He selected you. He selected that he would that he predestined. So that, by, that, by that I mean, what about all the people that are? Okay. So this is this is where our brains. So like I said, this is the thing I struggled with the most, because my mind wants to fill in the other side of it, right? And says, okay, God, you know what? I'm gonna. Um, can you guys all see that? I'm going to draw something. I was going to do it on this, but then they can't see it as well. Um, let's see. If you want to turn the screen just a hair so that it's easier to see in here. You want to turn the four in here? Yeah, so, well, yeah, so that they can see this too. Oh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, where's my... Uh-oh, what just happened there? That didn't work too well. There we go. All right, where's my... Come on. Ooh. Come on, computer. Don't mess with me now. Create a new whiteboard. Okay. All right, so... We got two kind of people in the world, believers and unbelievers. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Now you can see it. All right. So two kind of people in the world, believers and unbelievers. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> from what we talked about before, why does someone believe? If someone believes in Jesus, 
Why? What happened? Their life changed. Their life changed. Who did the changing? Maybe is the question. Jesus. Okay, Jesus. So we talked about, you know, by nature, we were dead, hostile, all of that. But God made us alive when we were dead, right? So he changed my heart, which then changes my, my life, right? So, so let's say, uh, you know, who gets the credit? If someone believes, God gets the credit, right? Um, let's actually, let's read a couple of passages. Uh, look on page 24 down at the bottom. Let's read those three passages, and then I'll finish drawing this picture. Uh, Dale, you want 1 Timothy 2, 4? God, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay. So what does God want? He wants everybody to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, and we talked about his, his antecedent and consequent will. So God's will is that everybody be saved. God wants people to believe in him. But he also knows that some will reject him. And because of that, there's a consequence. So that not everybody will be saved. But God wants, his desire is for all to be saved, to, to know about the truth. Um, how about Ezekiel 33? Um, talking about people who, who were not believing. Say to them, as surely as I live, <coughs> declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Yeah, don't make me punish you. It's kind of like the, the, the dad um, saying, all right, at the count of three, uh, you're going to get this punishment. One, two, two and a half, two and three quarters, but eventually three comes, right? Um, so I don't want to punish you, but uh, if, if you continue to reject, this is what happens. Uh, Jesus, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, kill the prophets, stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So um, if someone doesn't believe, whose fault is it? According to scripture. Theirs, right? So we've got human fault. Now you look at that well, when it comes up. Why is it? There you go. You look at that, and you uh, um, we come to Marion's problem here, right? If God picked those, if we couldn't do it on our own, well, then what about those others? But God says it's their fault. So now let's think logically through this. So if God gets the credit for those who believe, wouldn't it make sense that uh, if I don't believe, oops, uh, how do I erase? Oh, it does work. Nice. Um, wait a second. Why is my... <laughs> All right. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I'm going at. So if God gets the credit for those who believe, wouldn't it make sense that it's God's fault? You know, God chose some not to be saved, right? That's that double predestination I told you about. And there are churches that teach that. That makes sense. I get that. If this is true, that God gets the credit, well, then my mind says, okay, then it must be his fault because those other people, uh, he, he didn't change their heart, so he must not have wanted to. Um, but scripture says, no, God wants them to be saved. So, so that doesn't work. We say, okay, so the Bible is really clear that if someone doesn't believe it's their own fault, so that must mean that there must be something to it when someone does believe that, that they did something, right? This is, this is the teaching uh, that's known as decision theology. Basically says, you know, God, God did everything to save you, but it's, it, he gives everybody the choice. It's your pick. You can either decide to come to Christ or you can decide to, to not come to Christ. Um, but of course, the Bible says, no we're dead. We can't do that. We don't have the power to do that. And if we had the power to do that, we were hostile to God. We wouldn't have wanted to do that. Um, and so scripture says, no, decision theology doesn't work. Double predestination doesn't work. What scripture says is if someone believes, God gets the credit. And if someone doesn't believe, it's their fault. And our mind says, wait, 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 God, that's, and, and God says, who's God again? 
Are, are, are you, you know, it's one of these things where I finally take comfort in the fact that I don't get it. If my mind could understand everything about God, he wouldn't be that much of a God. Uh, he'd be like us. But since he is God, you know, and, and since he is God, he's able to, to do this. You know, my, uh, uh, one of the tests when you're dealing with different teachings so, like, if you're considering double predestination or decision theology or this, um, you know, the scriptural teaching of predestination, um, how do you know which one's right? Well, one, you look at what scripture says. And that's your final answer. Two, you look at what scripture says. Three, you look at what scripture says. And then if you're saying, yeah, but you can understand this way, you can understand it that way, then ask yourself, okay, what gives God glory? Because God is God, so he is all glorious, right? He gets all glory. So no matter what it is, God gets glory. Like he said for us, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. When it comes to this, it's all to the glory of God. So if God gets the credit for those who believe, that gives him glory, right? Yay, God. He changed my heart. He did this for me. That gives him glory. If God gets the fault... You know, if, if he's the one saying, I don't want you, that's taking away God's glory. That's saying bad God. And it's not bad God, it's good God. Um, so then go down to, if, if it's human's fault for not believing, well, that's not taking glory away from God. God wanted them to believe and they, they rejected. Um, but if human even gets a little bit of credit, that's taking some of the credit from God. Does that make sense? So yeah, this this is what scripture says. God gets the credit for those who believe. It's our fault if we don't or if we return from him. Um, double predestination does not agree with scripture. Decision theology doesn't agree with scripture. Any questions there, comments? Mary? What about the people referred to the old who's never really mm -hmm. coming from the church? Yeah. Sure. Um, on, on the one hand, you could say, well, yes, they are. They have the natural knowledge of God, right? They know that there's something out there and they know that they've messed up. So they should be looking for the answer. Sadly, many people say, oh, here's the answer. You just have to do this, this, and this, or, you know, follow the the path of Islam or, or you know, do the, the Buddhist thing or whatever, you know, whatever religion they've got, um, you do this and, and then you'll be fine. Now, sadly, that doesn't work because you still have your sins. Um, everyone needs Jesus and need, needs the forgiveness. Um, and so you say, well, what about those who, who haven't heard? Well, remember in lesson one, we had that passage that talked about uh, those uh, how, how God is merciful, gracious, full of compassion, forgiving, wickedness, rebellion, and sin, but he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You know, as, as you know, one generation says, I'm going to turn away from God, and then they teach the next and the next and the next. Um, at several times, or at least a couple times, all the world knew about God's promises. And then as generation said no i'm turning away they trained their their next generation and even now with missionaries having gone throughout the world and the internet and everything else the message is out there but many people just say i don't want to have anything to do with that, that message that doesn't make any sense that's foolishness um agreed there are some people that have a lot more access to it than others but the message has been throughout the world and is even now, it's just rejected in a whole lot of places. Um, but here again, when we start saying, okay, let me figure this out. What would be fair? We have to be honest, what would be fair? All of us going to hell. That's the only fair thing. Because a holy God and sin don't mix. We should all be destroyed. But God in his love and his grace, we didn't deserve it. God said, I'm going to send my son to pay for your sins. And, and he has said, you know, no one comes, Jesus said, no one comes to the father except through me. Um, you know, that, that there is only one payment for sin and that's, that's Jesus. And we have that through faith. So what about those others? Boy, let's go tell them. Um, 
we need to share the good news with them. Because if if ignorance worked as a way to heaven, God would be a liar. Remember when his son asked him, uh, if there's any other way, let's do it that way. God could have said, oh, just don't tell anyone. Um, and everybody will be fine. Uh, but he didn't say that. He said, this is what's necessary. Um, you know, every soul, that's between that person and God. So God's the judge, I'm not. I'm just going based on what he has said in his word, that we need the forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus, which is why it's so important for us to build up our understanding of it so that we can then share it with others. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, okay. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, we are out of time. I just uh, noticed that now. Um, I think you should all take a picture of that, that beautiful artwork on the screen because, I mean, that is, that is some handwriting that makes a, a teacher proud, right? Um, <coughs> but uh, uh, we'll, we will circle back to this at the beginning of next time um, and get that middle question, do I have to feel safe to be safe? But uh, uh, any closing questions now that, that's going, that are going through your mind? All right, then let, let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this time in your word tonight. Bless us that we cherish the gift of faith that you have given us. Continue to work in us through the word as we study, as we ask questions, as we find answers in your word, that our faith continue to be strengthened so that more and more we can live the holy lives that you have designed for us. Bless us as we fulfill our purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you. I didn't say hi to Ruth or Marcus. Good to see you guys on, or at least see your names. Good to see you too, Pastor. Awesome. Hey, Marcus, any news on the uh, basketball team? Um, he said he'll let me know by this week. Okay. All righty. Good. Well, you guys have a great night. Huh? Good to see you, Dale, Judy, and Marion.